Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your hurricane outlook and discussion, the off-season edition, continuing now for the 28th day of March 2016. Happy Monday to you. Thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at some things that might and should ultimately affect the upcoming hurricane season in the Atlantic. We'll start off today with a visit to Australia and the Long Paddock site here from Queensland government. What does this have to do with anything? Well, this is the Southern Oscillation Index, a pressure measurement uh, in the tropics, down in the tropical Pacific. And generally speaking, when we have significantly negative numbers, we are typically in an El Nino pattern within the atmosphere and the ocean coupling to work together to create that El Nino state. And conversely, when things are positive on the SOI scale, we typically see either neutral or La Nina conditions. La Nina conditions, the abnormal cooling of the tropical Pacific. So if we look over the last few months, you can see that it's been quite negative throughout the winter. Minus 10 was the 30-day value, the, the mean for December. January was a pretty uh, respectable negative 21. February not too far off the mark at minus 19. Well, now look what's going on here. The last 30 days, and we're almost done with March here, a pretty substantial climb. We're only at minus seven, and those numbers are going up overall, even though today's value here is negative 16. Overall, the pressure differences between Tahiti and Darwin are changing so that the background SOI state, or the Southern, Oscill uh, Southern Oscillation Index, is headed north, or positive, is a good way to put it. And therefore, this should start to really change as it has been even more so over the coming weeks. We are really losing the heat content in the Pacific. Trade winds are starting to increase here uh, in the tropical Pacific as they should. And we're losing that El Nino signature very steadily in the tropical Pacific. At the same time, the Atlantic and the Caribbean here in the deep tropics especially warming up to slightly above average levels and that's not the case up here in the Northeast Atlantic. This is very interesting, and I will look to see what Dr. Phil Klotzbach and his colleagues say about it collectively through his body of work that he will present at the National Tropical Weather Conference in beautiful South Padre down here in a couple of weeks, uh, first part of uh, the first half of April coming up, the 12th, 13th, 14th, and uh, we'll be able to hear what he is thinking about that. Really haven't seen the Atlantic this cold in the modern era of hurricane activity, um, and I say the modern era, I really mean the positive phase of the AMO or the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, fancy way of saying the Atlantic has overall been warmer than normal and we've had a lot more hurricanes since 1995 than, say, the previous 20 or 30 years or so. But this is really interesting that it's cooled off so substantially and I will be curious to see what, as will a lot of people, Dr. Klotzbach says with his update. And again, if we go back to the beginning of the year, I always like to do compare and contrast. And uh, look at this, the El Nino just glowing like hot embers here at the first part of the year. And clearly now, um, some 90 days later or so, the loss of the heat content in the Pacific is extraordinary. And especially, look what's going on up in the northern Pacific here and the areas around and south of the Baja Peninsula where they were very, very, very warm, especially last hurricane season. You remember all the activity we had out here, including the record-setting Patricia that went into Mexico. Um, well, we're losing that heat content, so maybe it'll be a different season completely with less activity in the Pacific and more activity in the Atlantic. Maybe not well above normal, I'm not seeing any indications that we're going to have a hyperactive season in the Atlantic, but it could be busier than we have seen since, let's say, 2012, and that's going to appear to be very busy to people if we have a couple of hurricanes hit the United States. It's all about perception, and there might not be 15 to 20 named storms and 10 hurricanes or anything, but we could still have more than we've had the last few years and those could hit land. We'll have to obviously wait and see. So I think it's an interesting season coming up to be sure for both the Eastern Pacific and the Atlantic. And we're getting close to time to where we're gonna really have to start talking about it more and more. 
because of the loss of the El Nino especially, but also that we're getting closer to June 1st, which is the traditional start of the hurricane season. Remember, we've already had one hurricane already way back in January. Remember that? It was January, right? Or maybe it was February. It's sad that I don't remember. But it was way out, you know, just in the ocean, not bothering anybody. So we will start the season going to the next letter in the alphabet, which is B. Um, What is the ones for this year? Is it Bertha or Beryl? I can't remember. Uh, We'll worry about that later. First things first. So this is the subsurface chart. Again, look at all of this cold water heading to the east here and the warm strip up to the, at the surface really being eroded away and you don't see any other large areas of warm subsurface water marching its way eastward. So the El Nino is done and it'll be gone and that'll be that. So the uh, actual ter- sea surface temperatures, especially for you spring breakers, uh, 20 degrees Celsius, that's what this isotherm represents right here. And that's around 68 degrees Fahrenheit, a little warmer than that over here in the Texas coastal waters. So, you know, it's in the mid to upper 60s for the most part. You might get a little chill with that. Uh, You know, it's not frigid, but if you're going on spring break across this region, the northern Gulf Coast states, it's warm enough, I guess you could say. And then the very warm water, summer-like water hiding to the south, a little warmer than it should be here in the loop current, but nothing that's raising any concerns for me anyway. I don't see any problems. The Gulf will always be warm enough once we get to the hurricane season to support pretty much any category hurricane. It's mainly a matter of upper level winds and how much moisture and instability is in the atmosphere, it seems, especially as of late. So mainly just wanted to show you for you spring breakers up here that, yeah, you can get yourselves in the water without being too chilly. Uh, So enjoy, but be careful out there. So let's look at lower 48 weather, another feature that I do here in the off season, trying to look for large disruptive storm systems. And we just had one in the last couple of weeks down here across the deep south, and then it moved across the southeast uh, proper and dumped a lot of rain, especially in Louisiana and Texas here. And we even set up a remotely operated camera in Deweyville for the record flood that came off the Sabine River. If you haven't seen that yet, It's on our Twitter feed, and it's on YouTube. If you just go to our YouTube channel, um, it's Hurricane Track on YouTube, and it should be one of the more prominent, more recent videos. And check that out, the time lapse and everything that we did from there. Um, Nothing like that coming up, though we do have some heavy rain. I'll show you that in a moment. Right now, the active weather is out west here, parts of the southwest United States with some increased fire danger, and then a range of winter storm watches and warnings and advisories as an active pattern unfolds out west, but nothing too disruptive in terms of a giant, massive blizzard storm system. It's just covering a large geographic area out here, but luckily, you know, there are some population centers. We're not talking about a huge disruptive storm, for example, up the I-95 corridor. Hopefully, for those of you that don't like winter, most of the winter weather, 99% of it is behind us, though it looks like we're going to have another little cold shot coming here out of Canada down into parts of the eastern two-thirds of the country as we start the month of April. And I can show you that a little bit here on the GFS. Let's go back to the very beginning of the loop, if I can. And this is the next uh, week or so. I'll start it at the beginning and then press play. Where's my play button? There you are. It says start. So here we are right now. This is the lower 48 here, Florida, and the west coast of the United States over here. And you can see, again, most of the active weather out west, but some of that starts to translate east with this low. And then a pretty heavy rain event tries to transverse across the southeast over the next few days towards next weekend. And then we do start to see a little bit more cold air draining in out of Canada as the polar vortex tries to make another appearance up here dropping some of that energy, lowering the heights of the middle parts of the atmosphere and the upper levels of the atmosphere down enough to allow what we call troughiness to take place. And let me show you what that looks like, by the way, at the 500 millibar level. Um, And I can compare that to where we are right now. Here's what it looks like today. And you can see active out west with the dip in the jet stream out that way and generally zonal flow across the rest of the country, which typically keeps things quiet 
But if we go out to seven days from now, a week, uh, 168 hours, yeah, look what happens. We get this uh, pretty substantial dip in the jet stream that comes in. Actually, it looks like it's trying to pretty much be over at that point. So let's go to day five, maybe get a better representation of that. There it is. I knew it was hiding in there somewhere. Um, that's some pretty good flow coming right out of Canada, wouldn't you say? Look at that. Man, just a straight northwest shot of cold air coming out of the uh, prairie and rocky Rockies, uh, what do you, the Canadian Rockies and points east of there, right down into the eastern two-thirds of the United States as we progress through the week and towards next weekend. And because of all the moisture streaming up out of the Gulf, you see quite a lot of rainfall in the QPF, the quantitative precipitation forecast. Once again, for parts of the east, if we can keep it out of this area, they would be much obliged, believe me. Uh, but rivers are going to be running high across this area, and we're looking at some instances of three and maybe more than that inches of rain. And this is accumulated over the next seven days, so something we have to watch for sure um, as things progress over the next couple of days. Be sure to watch your local weather service forecast and internet uh, Twitter people that you follow, you know, for reliable information. You know, there's some people that will put out doomsday forecasts, and you don't want to pay attention to that. Uh, and a good source, of course, is the Storm Prediction Center, which is my next stop here. The day one outlook, as I mentioned, no major severe weather, no large disruptive storm systems, just a, um, a little bit of an increase in convective activity in these regions. That includes the peninsula of Florida. And if we go to the next few days, you see here, that even moving through the week, not too bad. This is day two, which will be tomorrow. Starting to nose up into Tornado Alley, but again, very low probabilities overall when you see that light green color. At day three, though, things start to get a little bit more enhanced, and they have issued a slight risk for severe weather on the eastern part of Tornado Alley coming up out of the Gulf. So an active period as we get towards April, to be sure, but again, no major... Um, alarming severe weather events coming up, which is good. Stuff to keep an eye on for sure, but nothing that really makes everybody kind of worry that something really bad is coming. We don't want to see that. You remember April 27th, 2011, a couple weeks before that, the 16th with those super outbreaks in the Deep South, um, and we've had others, of course, in the Great Plains. Don't see anything like that coming, yet the increase in tornado potential is occurring as we get into April and, of course, May. So we'll talk about that more and more. And then before you know it, it'll be time for this to be called the Hurricane Outlook in Discussion with no off-season part. That's coming up. May 15th is the beginning of the East Pacific hurricane season. And I will resume the uh, almost daily outlooks on this. Um, we're only talking about a little over 45 days away. So anyway, well, that's it for me for the week. Again, no big storm systems to worry about. Tropics, interesting things going on that we will keep monitoring. But... You know, we still have a little ways to go, so make sure that you are ready no matter what happens, because you never know. There could just be one hurricane, and if it comes in your direction, you want to be ready for it. Have a good rest of your Monday, and as always, thanks for tuning in. I'm Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com, and I'll talk to you next week.